Hi and welcome. Uh, my name is Robert Green and this is History 363 Eastern Europe Life and Death on the Eastern Front. I want to welcome you to the course and in this the first of our weekly video presentations or video lectures I want to sketch out some of the main themes that we're going to be covering uh, over the next several weeks over the course of the semester to give you a sense of um, you know, the major sort of conceptual issues um, that you'll be dealing with in your readings, uh, in your assignments, and in our online discussions. So the course, uh, as you can tell from the title, focuses on Eastern Europe, the Eastern Front, during World War II, 1939 to 1945. And I want to focus on Eastern Europe, on the so-called Eastern Front, uh, because one of the points I want to make in this course is that while the war was devastating and destructive everywhere it was waged across the globe, nowhere was that destruction more complete, nowhere was that devastation more keenly felt uh, with such tragic outcomes than on the so-called Eastern Front, the site of the great cataclysmic struggle between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Now, let me preface my remarks by saying that I'm not a military historian. My own work lies in the fields of religious and cultural history. And in conceiving this course, I thought about conceiving it as a course that focused on the sort of political, social, and cultural dynamics of the war, and what historians call experience. What was the experience of the war like for ordinary people, soldiers and civilians alike? And I wanted to think about the mechanics of life and survival, death and survival, in this time of war. And to think about it in a variety of contexts, to think about it in terms of the heroic dimensions of the war, we'll talk about the resistance movements waged against Nazi occupation, on Soviet and Polish territory. I want to think, too, about less than heroic aspects, questions of the collaboration of local actors with the Nazi occupying forces. I want to think about the triumphs of victory and the poetics of commemoration, a theme that we'll cover more in the weeks to come. Think about how the war has been remembered as this great heroic moment in the national history and Russian and Polish peoples, but I also want to think about the great sense of destruction, loss, devastation, often cover-up, that accompanied and followed the war. So we'll think about how the vast majority of Eastern Europeans, Poles, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Jews, Russians alike, how they lived and died under Nazi occupation, and why. So while we'll talk about a few key battles, while we'll examine some critical turning points in the progress of the war, our focus in the weeks to come will be less on a blow-by-blow, battle-by-battle chronology of the war in the East, and more, again, about how ordinary citizens uh, in the Soviet Union and Poland uh, experienced this most horrific war in the history of mankind. How they experienced it and how they came to remember it. Now, when we're talking about the Eastern Front, I want to draw your attention to this uh, large territory in blue here. This is the principal theater of operations in the so-called Eastern Front. And if you juxtapose this alongside a map of Europe today, the territory of the so-called Eastern Front encompasses much of what is today the Russian Federation, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, and Poland. So we're talking about a territory that today is split among a half dozen or more independent sovereign countries, uh, but in the time of our uh, subject, 1939 to 1945, it's a territory shared uh, by the two principal states in Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union and Poland. And so geographically, we'll focus on those countries. That will be our focus over the next several weeks. 
These two nations, I should add, uh, are not only our focus because, <clears throat> because this is where the war was waged, but not coincidentally. These two nations, the Soviet Union and Poland, uh, proportionally, and in terms of real numbers, sustained the highest, most catastrophic losses in Europe during the war. This is a point, I think, that bears some elaboration, so please uh, bear with me as I give you these statistics. In the Soviet Union, the USSR, the Second World War claimed the lives of more than 26 million men, women, and children. 26 million. At least one out of every three Soviet war deaths was a civilian. At least one out of every three. Some estimates suggest civilian losses accounted for a full 50% of the total dead. 26 million dead is the figure endorsed by historians of the Russian Academy of Sciences, the Statistical Office of the Russian Ministry of Defense, and they are, from all that I've read, I think the most reliable, the most widely accepted statistics out there. Um, in your reading and in your research, you may well come across statistics that are, go even higher. Some estimates you know, suggest 27, 28, maybe as many as 30 million dead. And we're talking about a range of numbers here. And the very fact that we're talking about numbers that range so widely gives you some sense, I think, of the magnitude of the devastation. So total was the devastation of the war in the East in many regions, that reliable figures are, to this day, difficult, if not impossible, to compute. In any case, if we take that base number of 26 million, we're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 to 15 percent of the Soviet Union's total population killed in the war. 14 to 15 percent of the USSR's total population was killed in the war. And in those parts of the Soviet Union occupied by the Germans for much of the war, those numbers are even higher as the Germans implemented their destructive uh, racial and political ideology on the ground, a subject that we'll talk about today uh, and next week. Nearly one in five citizens of the Ukrainian Soviet Republic died in the war. A full 25% of the population of the Belarusian Soviet Republic perished. So we're talking about numbers that are utterly staggering. Losses, uh, statistics that simply boggle the mind. I mean, the human mind cannot wrap itself around numbers that are so large. Right? We, we reel in trying to, uh, to make sense of them. Let's put them in some perspective. To put those Soviet losses in context. Compare them with the losses sustained by the USSR's chief allies in the war, the US and Britain. The US and Britain combined lost approximately 870,000 dead. In the US, the war dead led to a population decline of less than one-third of one percent. In Britain, uh, just under one percent of the total population, again, versus the Soviet Union's 14 to 15 percent. Now, putting these numbers in comparative perspective is not to diminish in any way the Allied war effort shown by the British or the Americans. We know of the enormous sacrifices that the war demanded of soldiers, of nurses, of people back home on the home front. Now, many of us grew up hearing stories of those years and those sacrifices. So it's not to dilute or diminish that contribution in any way, but to put it in perspective. For every one American who died in the Second World War, 62 Soviet men, women, and children died. For every one American who died in the war, 62 Soviets died. We're talking about losses that represent a different level of magnitude altogether. And the numbers on this chart are less important than the bigger trend that it makes visible. What you see here is that <clears throat> uh, uh, scholars here have, 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 have put into comparative perspective uh, World War II military deaths in Europe uh, by front and year. So here we have deaths on the Western Front, 
and the Mediterranean front versus deaths on the Eastern front. Um, what you see is that we're talking again about an other, another level of magnitude altogether. The overwhelming number of military deaths in Europe between 1939 and 1945 occurred on the Eastern front. And as you can see here, that was the case for both the Allied powers and the Axis powers alike. If you were an Allied soldier fighting in Europe, if you were an Axis soldier fighting in Europe, chances are, if you died, you died on the Eastern Front. The vast majority of military deaths in Europe took place there. Because of the loss that the Soviet Union experienced in the war. Uh, the Second World War is probably the most important moment in 20th century Russian history, in a century that's full of uh, important and traumatic moments. Right? The Revolution of 1917, um, the Russian Civil War that followed, Stalin's uh, destructive collectivization drive, all of these uh, are overshadowed, I think, by the enormity of the Second World War. And one of the themes that we'll come back to over the course of this uh, class is how that war has been remembered, how that war has been commemorated, and how it's entered into the sort of public memory and collective memory of the Soviet and now Russian post-Soviet uh, people. Here you see a tableau of some uh, World War II monuments built by the Soviets. And again, we'll talk more about those in weeks to come and explore some of the aesthetic themes that are embedded in these memorials. Moving ahead, the Soviet Union's losses in the war could be rivaled only by Poland's. Proportionally speaking, Poland suffered greater losses in the war than any other country, period. Between 1939 and, of course, the German invasion of Poland, September 1st, 1939, began the Second World War. So between 1939 and 1945, the end of the war, more than 5 million Polish citizens perished. More than 5 million. About 2.5 to 3 million ethnic Poles, 2.5 to 3 million Polish Jews. In all, a full 90% of the Jews in Poland were dead by 1945. And so, again, Poland is sort of the second country uh, of our focus in this course. And Poland is incredibly important to understanding the dynamics of the war in the East, because, of course, it's in Poland that we see the full enormity of the killing machine that the Nazis set into motion. As you can see from this map, rail lines from all across the Reich led to the extermination camps at Treblinka, Bergen-Belsen, Kelmno, and, of course, most famously, Auschwitz. We'll talk about the evolution and implementation of the Nazis' so-called final solution and the Holocaust uh, in weeks to come. The main point of uh, this first week, I think, is to uh, think about the ideological dimension of the war, to think about the particular way in which the clash of ideologies on the Eastern Front, the clash between Nazism and Soviet Communism, the clash between the Third Reich and the Soviet Union, you know, how that clash of ideologies made the war different in the East, different than it was in Western Europe, the Mediterranean, North Africa, and elsewhere. And this is the big point I want to I want to stress this week. Uh, one of the reasons, the, the chief reason, that the death tolls were so high on the Eastern Front, or simply the Front, as the Soviets referred to it, uh, the reason why those death tolls were so high uh, is that the war in the East was markedly different than it was elsewhere. Again, that's that's a, that's a, that's an important point. The Nazis from Hitler down, from the Reichschancellery in Berlin, down to ordinary soldiers fighting on the front. They believed that the war in the East, the Ostkrieg, the Eastern War, was a different kind of 
And so I want to think about the war in the East, again, as a clash of ideologies, Nazism versus Soviet socialism, each seeing the other as the greatest threat to world peace. On the Nazi side, the war was seen as a clash between the superior German race, the Aryan race, versus the Slavic and Jewish Untermenschen, inferior peoples. And when the war uh, was carried out against the Poles, Ukrainians, Russians, Belarusians, and Jews, with such murderous intensity, it transformed the war on the Soviet side as well. By the time the tide turned at Stalingrad in 1943, the average Soviet soldier, the average Soviet citizen, saw the war not only as a sort of patriotic fight to reclaim lost territory from the fascist aggressor, but a war to exact vengeance, a war of retribution against an enemy that had shown them no mercy. So this combination of political clash, political hatred, fascism versus communism, combined with racial, national, patriotic hatred, made the nature of the fighting in the East particularly lethal. The historian Walter Lacour, who was for many years a professor at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, uh, described the Nazi-Soviet conflict as one of ideologies irreconcilably opposed. He wrote, the Nazis did not waver in their belief that communism was the Judeo-Masonic revolt of a racial underworld, while the communists persisted in regarding fascism as the Praetorian guard of monopoly capitalism. It would have made for high comedy, Lacour writes, but for the millions upon millions of victims. When the Nazis invaded Poland in September 39 and the USSR in June of 41, the style of war that they waged was markedly different than it would be or had been in the Low Countries, Norway, Denmark, France. In the East, given the intensity of these racial and political ideological divides, the boundaries between combatants and civilians in the East became blurred. Hitler explained to his generals why the war in the East was different. He said, the goal to be obtained in this war in the East is not that of reaching certain lines and positions on a map, but of physically demolishing the opponent. Only thus can we gain the living space that we need. These stated war aims, stated by the Führer, Hitler, to his generals, meant that the Eastern war would necessarily witness not only armies pitted versus armies, it would be a war in which civilians were deliberately targeted. A war in which civilian populations and non-military targets would be subjected to wholesale destruction. The Nazis aimed at waging a war of annihilation in the East, plain and simple. The Ostkrieg was to be a war to cleanse this conquered land. To cleanse it of what? To cleanse it of the Untermenschen, the inferior peoples who inhabited it. To cleanse and scour that land. To prepare it for Germanization. And what motivated this kind of thinking was the Nazi dream of Lebensraum, living space. So let's think a little bit about this German idea of Lebensraum. <clears throat> Since German unification back in 1871, there had been a pronounced sense of anxiety among German nationalists that their country was coming to the colonial game much later than Germany's chief rivals, France and especially Britain. Motivated by what they called Torschlusspanik, the fear of the closing door, German uh, politicians scrambled to acquire overseas colonies at the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries, seeking what German newspapers proudly proclaimed as Germany's rightful place in the sun. And they did so by establishing a colonial presence for Germany in uh, western and southwestern Africa, as you can see here, in the uh, Shandong Peninsula of China, the scattered island chains uh, in the southern Pacific. After World War I, 
and the German defeat, the Treaty of Versailles stripped Germany of its colonial possessions overseas and shrunk its borders in Europe. With the stroke of a pen, Germany lost 25,000 square miles of territory inhabited by some 7 million people. As you can see here, uh, this map shows you the German territorial losses uh, imposed by the Treaty of Versailles. Land that was taken in the east uh, to form the new state of Poland, land that was ceded here on the northern borders of East Prussia uh, to uh, Lithuania, land that was uh, ceded here to Czechoslovakia, and here as well, and land ceded to Belgium, land returned to France, and the demilitarized Rhineland. All in all, a humiliating dismemberment for German nationalists. 25,000 square miles of territory lost, 7 million people, most of them ethnic Germans. The German defeat, as many saw it, had taken place not on the battlefield, but at the, nego at the negotiating table. And angry and resentful at the dismemberment of their fatherland, angry and resentful at the reparation payments imposed upon them by the French and British, German politics in the 1920s took a decided turn to the right. This American political cartoon from the 1920s uh, makes that quite clear. It's entitled simply The Source, and it shows in no uncertain terms that Hitler and Hitler's party uh, are coming out of the Treaty of Versailles. There's a clear connection that the Treaty of Versailles has uh, produced Hitler's party. Right? This new breed of radical right-wing nationalists who emerged in Germany after 1919, these new uh, radical right-wing nationalists argued that the German people were at present confined, shackled, deprived of sufficient Lebensraum, living space. The German writer Hans Grimm, who was an early and vocal supporter of the Nazis, uh, wrote a book in 1928 called Volk ohne Raum, A People Without Space, the 1,300-page diatribe that sold nearly three-quarters of a million copies. That massive book boiled down to a very simple thesis. In order to achieve their full potential, the German people, the German race, needed, required, in Grimm's equation, Lebensraum. They needed living space. And they needed living space in a quantity suitable for their destiny. So in their quest to restore Germany to its rightful place of glory, to provide sufficient living space for the future expansion of the German race, the new radical right-wing nationalists of the 1920s, the Nazis chief among them, dusted off these old Prussian 19th century dreams of territorial expansion with one key, uh, key chief difference. Germany's first goal should be to expand not overseas into Togoland in Africa or the Caroline Islands in the Pacific, lands that had once been part of the German Empire. Germany's first goal instead should be to expand at home here in Europe. And the natural path of German expansion radical right-wing uh, political ideologues argued in the 1920s the natural path of German expansion lay to the east. This idea was known as Ostsiedlung, Eastern Expansion, and an early convert to this idea of Ostsiedlung, Eastern Expansion, was Adolf Hitler. In his 1925 autobiography slash political manifesto, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, Hitler wrote, it is not in colonial acquisitions that we must seek the solution to this problem of confinement, but exclusively in the acquisition of territory for settlement which will enhance the area of the mother country, and hence not only keep the new settlers in the most intimate community with the land of their origin, but secure for the total area those advantages which lie in its unified magnitude. A typically tangled sentence from the Fuhrer, what is he saying here? Right? Germany must expand, and it must expand its existing borders here in Europe. This is where the German community must grow. This is where the unified magnitude, as he says, of the German people 
must make their presence felt. Germany must shake off its shackles uh, that it's currently confined by and expand. The Germans had no choice, according to Hitler. For Hitler and the Nazis, German expansion was not an option, but, as he put it, an imperative. Nazi ideology imagined the folk, the nation, the people, as a living, breathing entity. So the law of nature itself dictated that the German racial organism must either expand at the expense of its inferior neighbors or be swallowed up by its powerful enemies. Expansion was a matter of moral and biological necessity, according to Hitler. It was a matter of securing and guaranteeing the future of the German nation. We must expand for our sons and daughters, for their sons and daughters, for the German race in perpetuity. As Hitler explained, Germany after Versailles is overpopulated. We cannot feed ourselves from our own resources. That's uh, an exaggeration, to be sure. But the takeaway point is this. If Germany is overpopulated, if its present borders are insufficient for its greatness, then what? Hitler says, without condition, uh, without consideration, excuse me, of tradition and prejudice, without consideration of tradition and prejudice, Germany must find the courage to gather our people and muster their strength for an advance along the road that will lead this people from its present restricted living space to new land and soil, and hence also free it from the danger of vanishing from the earth or of serving other races as a slave nation. This is a moral, political imperative. Germany must do this, or else it will be subjugated. Conquer or be conquered. The very first draft of the party program of the Nazi party declared, we demand land and territory for the sustenance of our people and colonization for our surplus population. Well, where to find this sustenance? Where to direct the surplus population of Germany. Hitler said, we will not fulfill our destiny in Cameroon, but in Europe. It was a very telling comparison. Cameroon had been one of the German-African possessions in the 19th century, taken away uh, by the Treaty of Versailles. It's not by going back to Cameroon, Hitler said, that Germany's greatness will be restored. Right? It is in Europe that we will fulfill our destiny. By the time Hitler wrote, or more accurately dictated, to Rudolf Hess, Mein Kampf, uh, his sights were set for expansion on the fields of Eastern Europe. This is where Germany must expand, to the East. Hitler writes, We must eliminate the disproportion between our population and our area, our landmass. Some of this land can be obtained from Russia. We must secure for the German people the land and soil to which they are entitled. So as Hitler and the Nazis understood it, Lebensraum, living space, was inseparable from the racial question. It was inseparable from racial thinking. We can't uh, disentangle these, these threads in Nazi ideology. The German race is superior. It has been temporarily reduced in status thanks to the humiliations imposed upon it by its wartime enemies. But it is still a superior race. It needs land. It needs land in order to expand, to regroup, to repopulate. And the land that beckoned, Hitler argued, was in the East. Rich, productive, fertile, arable land that was wasted at present on these inferior peoples. Slavs, and Jews. So the Nazis imagined this as a kind of biological imperative, a superior race expanding at the expense of an inferior one, and also as a kind of settling of old historical scores. The East was land that had once belonged to the hardy Germanic peoples a millennium before, till they had been displaced by the Slavic tribes. And now Hitler said it was time to take this back. So, as with all Nazi ideology, we see in this uh, argument for Ostsiedlung, for Eastern expansion, 
we see a kind of combination of pseudoscientific social Darwinistic thinking, race versus race, superior race versus inferior race, combined with this kind of quasi-mystical, quasi-historical notion of, uh, of destiny. Right? It's the German people's destiny to expand. So from the very beginning, Hitler's vision lay to the east. After coming to power in 1933, at his very first meeting with his generals, Hitler spoke of the need to proceed with what he called the ruthless Germanization of the eastern lands. To make full use of its riches, that land would have to be rid of the inferior peoples who inhabited it at present. Before the land could be used, it would have to be rid of the races who were at present ruining it. As I said, racial thinking, racial science, as the Nazis called it, was the key to understanding history, current affairs, future political and geopolitical outcomes. Race was the key to understanding national character, and the Nazis spent a great deal of energy trying to create uh, and to order and organize these intricate racial hierarchies, formulating uh, typologies of racial physiognomies, as you can see from these photographs of racial, quote, types, uh, assembled from a Nazi-era book on racial science. Nazi wisdom held that when it came to the races of Europe, the Slavic peoples, Russians, Ukrainians, Poles, and so forth, were untermenschen, inferior peoples, clustered at the bottom of the racial totem pole. Just above the most inferior of races, the Jews and the Romani, or the Gypsy people. The Eastern peoples, the Slavs and Jews, were so far beneath the lofty German race, the Nazis believed, that they took to describing the Eastern parts of Europe as Raum ohne Volk, flipping the title of Grimm's book upside down. If Germany was a Volk ohne Raum, a people without land, the East was a vast stretch of land without people, just lesser creatures waiting to be swept aside, land just waiting to be folded into the German Reich. The great obstacle, of course, standing in the way of Hitler's Eastern vision was his arch-nemesis, the Soviet Union. And for Hitler, the Soviet Union was a kind of perfect storm. Demographically and politically, the USSR was the very embodiment of the peoples and ideas that Hitler hated most. Slavs, Jews, and Bolshevism, communism. All three of those uh, things very closely bound together, very closely intertwined in the Nazi racialized imagination. Hitler saw Bolshevism, Marxism-Leninism, uh, as nothing more than a Jewish plot. He had expressed this conviction clearly in his writings and speeches going back to the 1920s. Uh, for Hitler and for the Nazis, uh, Marxism masqueraded as a philosophy of emancipation, a philosophy of uh, equality, when in fact it was really a device, a ploy to allow the Jews to take over the world. After all, Marx had been a Jew in the Nazi formulation. Marxism, therefore, was inseparable from Jewish uh, perfidy, Jewish efforts to take over the world. It was a cover, the Nazis said. Marxism was a cover for the international Jewish conspiracy to deliver the world and all of its wealth into the hands of a secret cabal of Jews pulling the strings. In Russian Bolshevism, Hitler wrote, we must see the attempt undertaken by the Jews in the 20th century to achieve world domination. Marxism as a Jewish plot. Uh, that notion is expressed in this Nazi poster that you see. This is a Nazi poster from 1945. It's printed in Russian and it's addressed to the Red Army soldier. And of course, this is at a time when the Red Army is uh, on the march through Eastern Europe, 
back toward Germany, toward Berlin. It's a matter of time now before Berlin falls. And this is a last-ditch effort on the part of Nazi propagandists to uh, try to convince Russian soldiers to put down their arms. It says, Red Army soldier, do you think you're, quote, liberating the nations? Stalin had said that the Red Army, the Soviet Army, was liberating the nations of Eastern Europe from the Nazis. First, liberate yourself from your own oppressors. Liberate yourself from your own oppressors. And what do we see here? We see that behind the Red Army soldier, right? right who has the soldier on a leash? The Red Army commissar. Who has the commissar on a leash? Stalin. And who has Stalin on a leash? The true mastermind, the caricatured Jewish uh, conspirator. And although this image comes from 1945, from the very end of the war, it's reflective of, it's typical of, the Nazi position on so-called Jew Bolshevism, or Jewish Bolshevism. And you find this in Nazi texts, uh, party programs, going all the way back to Mein Kampf in the 1920s. Here, a Nazi poster from 1943, designed to enthuse an increasingly war-weary German nation. Uh, the poster reads in German, Victory or Bolshevism? Right? The idea being that only one choice stands before Germany now. Victory, right, a bright future for our children, a future solidified by victory, or a future of enslavement a future of enslavement under Bolshevism. And of course, the Soviet commissar on the right is represented in stereotypically, exaggeratedly anti-Semitic style. Again, equating Jewishness and Bolshevism and making a very clear distinction between the bright, radiant uh, uh, German-Aryan race and the uh, equation of Jewishness and communism, Bolshevism. Finally, a Nazi poster printed for distribution in occupied Lithuania. The Germans occupied Lithuania from 1941 uh, until the tide turned, 44. Uh, here we see a caricatured Jew wearing uh, what in Russian is known as a kepka, a Russian-style cap uh, made famous by Lenin, among others. And we see uh, behind uh, the Jew in the kepka is the Star of David. So again, juxtaposing the idea of the Jew uh, over and against, alongside the uh, symbol of Bolshevism here, Lenin's hat. And the poster is written in Lithuanian, and it says that the Jew is your eternal enemy. Right? Again, it's addressing the Lithuanian people. The German occupiers say to you, Lithuanians, the Jew is your eternal enemy. And at the bottom it says, Stalin and the Jews are one big band of scoundrels. Communism and Jewishness are one. And this text in the middle is a series of questions and answers, a kind of uh, sort of Nazi racial catechism. Uh, and the questions ask, who imprisoned millions of people in labor camps? Answer, the Jew. Who is responsible for the suffering of the Lithuanian people? Answer, the Jew, and so on and so forth. And as you can see, at each turn, regardless of what the question is, the answer is the Jew. The Jew is to blame. Bolshevism unmasked, this caption reads, and we see a world set in flames by the union of the hammer and sickle, the symbol of Soviet socialism, Soviet communism, uh, set against the Star of David. Images like this, and the ones we've just seen, made visible a series of ideological presuppositions that Nazi party members subscribed to. And after 1933, when Hitler assumed full power as Fuhrer, those messages became part of the Nazis' everyday indoctrination of the German people. After nearly a decade of exposure to this kind of racialist thinking, not only the SS and diehard Nazis, but ordinary German men, too, marched to the East in 1939 and again in 1941, prepared to do battle against an enemy that they believed to be less than human. 
an enemy against whom any act of cruelty, therefore, could be justified. On the other side, by the time the war began in 1939, the Soviet propaganda machine had been crusading against fascism for years. You think about what's taking place in Europe in the 1920s and 30s, right? The rise of fascism in Italy with Mussolini, the growth of the uh, fascist movement, the Nazi movement in Germany, culminating in 1933 with Hitler's rise to power. Uh, Britain and France, the Western democracies, seemed relatively indifferent to the rise of fascism in Europe. By contrast, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union under Stalin had been sounding the alarm since at least the late 20s, and certainly from the 30s forward, that fascism was the single greatest threat facing the world today. Here you see a Soviet poster from the 1930s, and it says, The United Anti-Fascist Front Shall Be Victorious. And what do we see? We see the red rifle of the socialist camp smashing the hangman's gallows of fascism with the uh, sort of caricatured uh, German fascist soldier uh, with a look of desperation on his uh, animalistic face, desperately clutching this bomb as a kind of last-ditch effort against the uh, insurmountable power of the Red Warrior. And at the bottom it says, Working men, working women, peasants, and laborers of all countries join and strengthen the popular front against fascism and war. So calling upon an international coalition to band together against a common foe, militant fascism. And joining in this caption the idea of fascism and war. Right? Fascism is inseparable from war. The war will come because the fascists want it to come. And that's, that becomes a main theme in the Soviet wartime propaganda that we'll look at in a couple of weeks. What's interesting, if you look at Soviet propaganda um, about fascism, about Nazism, uh, and contrast it with Nazi propaganda against Soviet communism, what's different here is that the Nazis imagined their Soviet enemy, as we've seen, in racialized terms, right? the idea of Jew Bolshevism. The Soviets saw the Nazi enemy in political terms. The Nazi was an enemy, according to Soviet propaganda, not because he was German, but because he was fascist. Now that distinction gets a little blurry, as we'll see uh, during World War II, but in the 1930s, in the pre-war period, uh, that, certainly, that certainly holds true. Fascism is shown here as the enemy of nations, and it shows fascism as a monster with a death's head that has Germany now in its grip. Right? And out of the barrel of a gun, these, these uh, dagger claws come to encompass Germany. And from Germany, what will be the next domino to fall? Right? This fear of fascist aggression that was made visible, made manifest in Soviet propaganda, was put into practice in the 1930s uh, in Soviet foreign policy. Soviet foreign policy in the 30s was largely oriented uh, toward checking and containing the spread of communism. I'm sorry, the spread of fascism, obviously. Yeah. When Mussolini invaded Ethiopia in 1936, the USSR was the only country steadfastly to refuse to recognize the Italian occupation of Ethiopia. Hitler's reoccupation of the Rhineland in 1936, Franco's civil war in Spain, the Nazi takeover of Austria, the Anschluss in 1938. At each of these crisis point junctures, the Soviet foreign ministry, at Stalin's direction, solicited the cooperation of the British, the French, the Poles, anyone who would stand up to fascist aggression. We must form a popular front. We must form a united front. And this marked a great uh, turnaround in Soviet foreign policy. Uh, up until the 1930s, Soviet foreign policy had been based on the idea that there must be no collaboration, no cooperation between the Soviet regime and the liberal democracies in the West. Right? They are our implacable uh, ideological enemies. But in the 1930s, with fascism on the rise, Stalin began to make overtures 
You know, the democracies were the lesser of two evils. If they had to be courted in order to form a common front against fascism, then so be it. Uh, the problem was that the uh, fa uh, liberal democracies in the West were not receptive to Soviet overtures. We can see this very clearly at the Munich Conference in the fall of 1938. At the Munich Conference, the British and French agreed to let Hitler annex the Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia in exchange for his solemn promise that this would be his absolute last final territorial demand in Europe. So while the British and French stood by to allow Hitler to annex the Sudetenland, this territory uh, here in Czechoslovakia, home to some three million ethnic Germans, the Sudetenland was uh, handed over to Germany with a promise from England and France that they would do nothing to oppose. Here you see the participants of the Munich Conference, 1938, the British Prime Minister Chamberlain, the French Premier Daladier, the German Fuhrer Hitler, and Benito Mussolini, the Italian dictator. Who is not at the Munich Conference? Well, the Czechs. The Czechs were not invited to what turned out to be the uh, partitioning of their own country. And also, pointedly absent, uh, Stalin, the Soviets. Just six months after the Munich conference, Hitler naturally broke his word and annexed not only the Sudetenland, but the rest of what is today the Czech Republic. Then he began making threats toward Poland over the so-called Polish Corridor, this disputed territory uh, taken from Germany after World War I at Versailles to allow the newly created Polish state access to the Baltic Sea. At this point, Stalin's foreign minister, in early 1939, Stalin's foreign minister, Molotov, offered the Poles a mutual protection treaty. The Polish government refused the Soviet offer, saying that if it had to be invaded, Poland would prefer to be invaded by the Germans rather than the Russians. I mean, to understand the craziness of that response, I mean, you have to understand the centuries of bad blood between the Poles and the Russians, not to mention a very recent and destructive war between the Poles and the young Soviet state that had been fought back in 1920-21. So the Poles rebuff uh, the Soviet overtures. It's at this point in 1939, with the Nazi state poised, it seems, to take Poland, and in doing, bring the borders of Germany right up to the very borders of the Soviet Union itself, it's at this point that Stalin decided to take a new tack in foreign policy. If the West, Britain and France, persisted in playing the politics of appeasement, and if the West would not join him in a tactical alliance against fascism, then Stalin would seek a tactical, even if temporary, alliance with Hitler. The Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact was signed in Moscow, on August 23rd, 1939. And here you see from left to right the Nazi foreign minister, Joachim von Ribbentrop, Stalin, and Stalin's foreign minister, Molotov. According to the terms of the non-aggression pact, which was supposed to remain in effect for a full 10 years, Germany and the Soviet Union pledged that neither would attack the other country, nor would either join any political, military, strategic alliance that would jeopardize the security of the other. Should either country be attacked by a third power, the other would, quote, in no manner lend its support. And this was what was made public. And this was what shocked the world. When the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact was announced at the end of August 1939, it sent shockwaves across the world. The two most utterly opposed ideological powers in the world, Soviet communism, German Nazism, seemingly having buried the hatchet. The German foreign minister standing, smiling next to the Soviet dictator. Right? I mean, that the world was shocked by the announcement of the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact. It's difficult to overestimate 
the degree to which this was just a staggering blow, particularly, I should add, just in passing, uh, particularly to communist movements and communist uh, parties across the globe. They didn't know what to do. Uh, it, it, it prompted a moment of sort of schism within the international communist movement. Do we support Moscow, as we've been taught to do, or do we break with Moscow over this you know, intolerable uh, alliance with our great enemy, uh, Nazism? Communist parties around the world were torn in half by this. In addition to the public uh, declaration of the content of the non-aggression pact, there were secret protocol, protocols as well that were not made public. The secret protocols of the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact said that between the two of them, Hitler and Stalin agreed to carve up Eastern Europe amongst themselves. The Soviets would take Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Eastern Poland, Poland up to the Vistula River. Germany would get the rest. And here you see the actual original map from the meeting, uh, with Ribbentrop's scribblings, uh, Stalin's scribblings, uh, establishing these new borderlands that would be uh, drawn. Stalin's signature up top in blue, and Ribbentrop's down here in red. With the non-aggression pact in place, with his eastern front secure for now, uh, just one week later, on September 1st, 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland. Britain declared war on Germany, France followed suit, and so the Second World War began uh, not 21 years after the conclusion of the first. On September 17th, 1939, the Soviets rolled into eastern Poland. And the following year, 1940, in accordance with the secret protocols of the non-aggression pact, Stalin uh, entered and annexed Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. It was clear that both sides had used the other. For Stalin, the pact brought him time, and it allowed him to extend the USSR's borders and to export Soviet-style communism westward. For Hitler, the non-aggression pact with the Soviets uh, ensured that he would not have to fight a two-front war until he was ready to do so. Hitler explained to his general staff, at the present time, at the, at the time of the signing of the protocols, Russia offers no danger, but the treaty is to be kept only as long as it is expedient. We can oppose Russia only if we are free in the West. So in the end, what was supposed to be a 10-year pact between these new uh, best friends lasted less than 24 months. After conquering France in 1940 and subduing England for the moment, Hitler turned to the east once again in search of Lebensraum, just as he had always said he would. On June 22, 1941, the Nazis launched Operation Barbarossa, the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, an invasion, uh, as we'll see next week, that was informed by Nazi racial thinking and by the ideological imperative of Lebensraum, living space. So we'll turn to the invasion of 1941 and an overview of the period 1941 to 1945 uh, next week. Thank you.